they are in Vrindavan, they often have beautiful kirtan at the temple hall or Guru Puja in a very unique and mesmerizing way. We know this Christianity as Janardhan Prabhu for many, many years. And from Janardhan Prabhu to His Holiness, Bhakti Anugra Janardhan Swami, today I have His Holiness with me sitting right here for the very first time when we'll try and know more of Him and we'll understand what is it that changed his life completely that brought him from the West to Braj. From a Westerner to a Brajwasi, how's the journey been? Let's try and discover His Holiness Bhakti Anubhra Janardhan Swami. Maharaj Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. It's, it's really nice and I'm so glad that you've probably agreed for the first time to come live with someone for a chat show. I've never ever seen you before on any channel, but you agreed and I'm grateful to you for this. Maharaj, you know what? People know you as a very great personality and at times extremely friendly. I really want to know who in reality would His Holiness Bhakti Anuprajanathan Swami be? Well, I, uh, I was born in the Philippines and uh, I first come in contact with Krishna Consciousness at the age of uh, 15 years old in 1977, let's say uh, fall. October 1977. Oh, just a month prior before Prabhupada left the world. Yes. And right from the very beginning, I was very interested in getting information about life. What is the goal of life? What is this all about that we are searching for? Like the way how the modern education of modern civilization is presenting and not so satisfied. And therefore I keep searching, searching, searching. And then one day I get this books of Silla Prabhupada in a, like a bookstore. Never met any devotees then. I met directly Prabhupada's books. Directly Prabhupada through his books. Easy journey to other planets and the perfection of yoga. That was in 1977. And some Bhaktika and magazines, the magazine of our movement, our society. And so I became so interested because the pictures, as there is a saying, the picture tells a thousand stories. Sure. And the pictures in Prabhupada's books. He mentions many few times that there are windows to the spiritual world. So the kind of presentation is so attractive, so appealing that in those books and in the magazine I read Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, everywhere. Like so I was figuring what is this Bhagavad Gita? And therefore I tried to order the Bhagavad Gita. The Philippines through mail order, and I asked my mother to purchase the book for me, so she gave me the money. I sent the money to the post, so now the book did not come. <laughs> so that made me more eager to see what is this Bhagavad Gita. So 1977 to 1980, early, I went to Canada, early 1980. I was before turning seven, uh, 18 years old. From then on, when I reached Canada, then I went back to the back to the magazine, and it says there that you can purchase different, different books. And then I subscribed to Bhaktivedanta and everything. I was with my hand. You found that this is the history of the most part of Canada. Now we're getting close to England or something. 
this area is near that area where the Titanic sank. So I finished my school, college, and then in 1984 I went to Toronto. And then still not satisfied with what's going on. Look again in the back of the book, or the back to get it, it says there's a temple, there's a center in Toronto. So I went to the temple one evening, and from there I, uh, I was given a bowl of halaba. Oh, really? Halaba Pasaat. And the devotee gave me a few more books. Good donation, and that was the start. Like every Sundays or the weekends, I would come to this temple because I was working summer job. And then I figured out, you know, devotees are not very, very happy. No tension, no stress, no anxiety. So I figured out maybe uh, because I'm, I was living outside, I mean outside, yes, the whole world is living outside, the only world is living inside. So I thought to myself, well, why don't I just give my rental money to the temple and then I will ask them if I can stay in the temple. Wow. Did they agree? Of course, they yeah. like me so much. <laughs> because I would... India. 
So he lives in Chicago. So from Toronto, I will fly to Chicago, meet him, to go to the Philippines, then to go to India. And he would send a few things for my mother, for the family. So he would pay like half the price or the ticket. It's not, it's not a problem for that. So yes, I came to India as far as I can remember, the earliest is 1987. And that's the time when the project actually started. Oh no, it was already completed. Yeah. So what was your first interaction with the Hopi Center? Did you come to Vrindavan or Juhu or Hyderabad? No, always Vrindavan and Mayapur also. Okay. But Vrindavan um, most of the time. Sometimes we will go Kartik and then sometimes we will go to uh, go for Lima time. So we will go to Vrindavan. Festivals in those days uh, is a combination with the Mayapur festival. So, yes, I'm very attracted immediately to Vrindavan. I will pray that I will come back every year. But then later on, the prayer is different that I would like to stay here. <laughs> I would like to reside here with the permission of the Guru also. Yeah, so 1987, every year, every year, every year. So. But you see how much what happens as you, you were a student, a uh, successfully accomplished professional, and they're up, uh, you know, giving up everything. I appreciate that your parents were never a gift for you. To do. But you know, at the back of the mind, in every family household, the culture is the children they grow up, they, they get married, and then they further expand the family, right? So, how did this thing of giving up everything and becoming a brahmachari came up to your mind? And how did your family react to that? Why? Because you were born in a different nationality and land altogether, Culture. beliefs and faith and yeah. culture is completely different. And children, they just walk up to something which is totally contrary to what you've been uh, brought up practicing. So, how was that particular thing? How did your family react to it? Well, well, in the beginning, they're they're worried, of course. Like my mother, she would ask me, "What's going to happen to you when you get old?" Every every parent has a similar concern because it's natural because they care and love towards the child and no one can be equal to that. Yeah. So they worry that if you will get old, you need someone to take care of you. And if, what if we are not there anymore? So I told them, no, no need to worry. Krishna will take care, take care of all of us. So in this way, somehow, they, they did not really like uh, oppose what I, what I was doing. They were actually very supportive. My father would give me some money also to go back to India. Some pocket money or something. Because if you suppose, I would go see his shaved head already. So, yeah. And I'm very grateful for them because in this way I, I took the process seriously. In, in, in Asia, especially, the family bondage is very strong. Yes. You cannot, you cannot like, For example, in India, you go to one's family, you will see grandparents, and uncles, and aunties, and brothers, and sisters. And you can have like three or four generations staying together. Yeah, staying together in one small space, right? But uh, coming to Krishna consciousness means you can take the whole world as your family. Not just your blood family, but everyone like me. They are parts and parcels of the Supreme Lord. So especially when you take sannyas, the whole world is your family. Maharaj, you've, you've 
Queen Janardhan Prabhu gave one of you as Janardhan Prabhu and from there to His Holiness. We you know when, when the status of pronunciation changes, naturally the, the degree of responsibility as well. Mm -hmm. it, how do you look at the transition from Prabhu to Swami? Um, I don't see much. Main thing that I, I can realize or experience that I should be more detached is what we call indifference. Indifference means if someone is like when I go travel, if the accommodation is very nice, fine. If the accommodation is adequate, fine. If the accommodation is like you know, Whatever, whatever they offer is there, it's fine. We cannot be juicy. It's everything we learn. Austerity is very, very important. Um, is a change. Is a consciousness more. In the beginning, as a brahmachari, we may be thinking for ourselves. But then, when you become sannyas, you don't. Think of yourself practically. Mostly you think of others. How you can help them, how you can inspire them, how you can increase them in Krishna consciousness. Because that is the duty of sannyasis. And for me, it is like a natural. Natural. It's like in Vrindavan, we don't have any other service except to take care of our food after the devotees. And it just carried on. Because I'm in the mood, if I may say. And therefore, when I became sannyas, it just increased more. Not just here, but the whole world. You know, with this particular conversation that I'm having with Maharaja, I'm going to reveal one thing to you. What really inspired me to approach him and request him to give me his audience is that very recently, one of my very good friends who is based in the garden lost his life because of COVID-19. And when I was speaking to him, he virtually started crying, telling me how much love Maharaj actually has for devotees that he agreed to visit his place and spend almost an hour. I'm speaking with Prabhu already. Right? Well, we had a discussion before I came to Vrindavan and I was expressing my, my condolences for his late wife that she left too early and instead of seeing couple of months that they married. And believe me, while speaking of you was in his house and he was in tears. And that really touched my heart so much and I was wondering that what we at times feel is to approach the Nazis is very difficult. But at the same time, you know, you were so kind and gentle that you went to this place and expressed your solidarity to him. Thank you so much Maharaj on his behalf also. Right Maharaj, another thing is, you know, we've seen that the devotees in the West are pretty straightforward and simple to mingle and to deal with. And on the other hand, you know, Indians could be a little tricky. Or a little hard. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is the difference about it? You've been dealing with devotees in India for so long. You travel to so many places. Did you ever find that there's difference? I mean, we're just trying to become a devotee. One, one of the foremost quality of a devotee is sarana, simplicity. Simplicity means no pretensions, no wicked-minded, no duplicity. We can attain Krishna consciousness, make progress, attain the goal, if right from the very beginning we learn this quality. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether you are in Canada or the US or Middle East, Europe or India. If you don't know how to present yourself as you are and be who you are, be simple. I mean, just be genuine. Yeah, genuine, genuine mood of a devotee is just to be himself, to be her, herself. 
then one will find it difficult to practice Krishna consciousness. I mean, I've been in Vrindavan for 19 years now. I've been here since 2002. Guru Maharaj brought me here. Even though my first coming was 1987, and when I left Canada in 1997, I just want to stay in Vrindavan, but Guru Maharaj told me, says you come with me. Guru's order was to be And I also know that you've been serving in Delhi Temple for a very, very long time. I was there for five years. I was vice president. Now I was in charge of the voluntaries. Serving in Guru Maharaj also for many, many years. So, Yes, I don't, I don't find any difference between here and in the West, but, but in the West they are a little bit more straightforward, of course, in dealings. It's a kind of culture that they have. They will tell you if they don't like you, they will tell you if they like you. But here, even if they don't like you, they will still say, I like you. <laughs> so, what to do? We just have to. But we, we should not be like, you know, others who are. If we know that others dealing with us are not straightforward, we should still be straightforward with them. Because if we follow the way they treat us, then we will become like them also. Very judgmental. Yeah, then it will be a problem in the future. Because once you start lying, you'll just continue to lie. One degree, then it becomes big, 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 big. You have a one lie after say other lie. Yeah, it's it's not so easy to to control that. So right from the very beginning, I I, I think because of my parents, they brought me up in a in a religious way. Back. Then when you become a devotee, a practicing devotee, then you develop that Yes. Maharaj, what is the legal name on the passport? We, we've never heard that. Why? I mean, it's just out of curiosity, <laughs> the legal name on the passport. Why name? Okay, my legal name is Joram. Oh, Joram. Like Jairam. <laughs> Joram Katorna. So Maharaj, with your experience of Raj in 87 when you came and you gave your sitting in 2021, how have you seen things shaping up and changing? My only point is, in at the end that year 87 you want to be in Vrindavan, when the love was practically nothing. In comparison to where you see the love today. Yes. So really, you want to be in Vrindavan, there was so far no air conditioning, no systematic living for the body, natural that the austerity was getting a much higher than what Yeah, well in those days, there is not even uh, cooler. Yes, and the heat was always the same. Here, the other is always the same. But we should not be bothered by you know, external things. External things may change, but we should try to capture what is the mood in Vrindavan, which is service. But the Basis, this is their mood, to always serve Krishna. So, I didn't find it so much difference except the externals, because now, compared to then, now we have big, big skyscrapers, so we say skyscrapers, a lot of constructions going on. Um, become more urbanized, actually. Yeah, well, I mean, busy. Like last night, we, we just came from Radhakur. And when we came back, it's like uh, business as usual. And then that, it's like there's no order. You know, and, um, mask is not really like, essential now. This is, The whole thing is that 
the Mai Vrindavan, there is a movie called Mai Vrindavan, means the external Vrindavan may change and as Kali progresses will become more deteriorated, it will be like almost like a desert. And but what is not changing here is that the mood, the bug, the love of the devotees for the rest of the world, it should be increasing because they are performing bhakti, chanting. We have many devotees in the world like that. Some may come for some other reasons except bhakti. They may find it here or they may not find it here. But everyone who is seriously would like to go deeper in their bhajans or in their relationship with the Supreme Lord, they will find it here. In spite of these external changes that's been going on year after year. And we still have 427,000 years in order to end the Yuga. So let's just say what's going to happen in 1,000 years from now. What, what will Vrindavan look like? Up in the US. <laughs> it's going to be fully dense. Many more people, thousands and thousands more people. But some are genuine who comes here for bhakti. But many are coming here not for bhakti. They find it this as an opportunity for them fulfill their material desires somehow or another in whatever capacity or whatever means they see Vrindavan as an opportunity for them to fulfill their material desires so did you all see for 19 years that Maharaj has been a Pratwasi he has been maintaining that mood of intense bhakti service and surrender to Krishna with the instructions of his guru days and has been holding a very, very big responsible position within the temple management and administration as well. Maharaj, for me, it's always an inspiration and motivation to come in contact with you and observe you very minutely. I'm so grateful that today we had an opportunity for a personal interaction. Last, before we conclude this session, Maharaj, after you take sannyas, the next is to go back to Krishna. Right? With what mood can we achieve Krishna in this life? We're full of faults. It is so difficult to become perfect the way it is recommended in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. What is it that can take us back to Krishna? You know, if you could give us in bullet points, one, two, three, what can take us back to Krishna within this life, irrespective of being grudge or out of grudge? Well, I think what, what is foremost is one's sincerity. As much as possible, try our best to serve in whatever capacity or ability that we possess. Krishna is looking for this our sincerity. Sincerity means you are a surrender, and as much as possible, try to be in the mood of service, especially to the Vaishnavas. And always see yourself as fallen. The, the process actually is like continuous. There's never a time that, okay, you're pure enough, then you cannot be more pure. There's no limit to it. No, it, it's just like, it's like gold. It becomes more and more refined as the more you put it into fire. The, the nature of the goal started to show. So in the beginning, it doesn't look like gold. Oh, it's not precious metal. So the more we practice this bhakti process, especially in our chanting and hearing the sastra, hearing the holy name, there's no difference. The more we perform this kirtan, Kirtan doesn't mean only chanting, the reading also discussing about the subject matter. I would 
say whatever we're lacking, uh, down with that, and Krishna will fill it up for us to go back home back together. That's the space from our success of me and this is you like our practices. Yeah. You can see. And one must have a guide. One must have a spiritual master. No one goes back to Godhead without committing or surrendering oneself unto a bona fide representative of the Supreme Lord because he is the external representative of the Supreme Lord. And therefore, his words is as good as Krishna. And if somehow he, he gives us instruction in order to make advancement, then we should do it wholeheartedly. Because it is a science. It is a science. We have to follow step by step by step. Follow for regular principles. Get up early in the morning. Do mantra arti. Chant. Read. Do perform practical devotional service. So if we do that, Prabhupada says that also. Anyone who chants 16 rounds minimum, sincerely, and follow the four regulative principles, and do this routine work. It's a routine work. Every day, we do the same thing. Like getting up early in the morning, go Magalarti, chant Hare Krishna, listen to Bhagavatam class. And the whole day, just doing some practical work or service towards the Supreme Lord. But we never get tired. Not at all. We never actually we get more strength. I mean, I joined 1984, now it's 2021. How many years is that? Almost 40. Yes. Right? 37 or something? You're going to be the right. But no, we get tired. So we should not be slack, as Prabhupada says. Uh, guaranteed, if you keep doing this, then at the time of death, you go back home back to God. Yeah. Maharaj said, never get tired, and that's very much visible with his style, with the figure that he performs, Kirtan, at the temple called Guru Puja in the morning. And he summarized this so beautifully, saying, sincerity, service, surrender, and sadhana can take us back home, back to order. And in case if we are, you know, if there's a deficit of anything, Krishna is kind enough to fill that gap and call us back home, back to order. Maharaj, thank you so much for your precious time.